You're watching Truth vs. Hype. The encounter of Ishrat Jahan and three others has once again hit the headlines. But this time the wheel has come full circle. The CBI's findings that it was a fake encounter had brought the BJP-run government headed by Chief Minister Modi and his deputy under fire. But now it's the Congress on the back foot, with more and more voices coming forward to claim that the UPA had tampered with information to the case, particularly to bury Ishrat's LET links. Certain sections of the media too have faced criticism, like this show, for falling prey to the political games being played. In response, there's been a pushback to question the claims being made by the BJP and these former officials. All this deluge of information can be extremely confusing. So over the next 30 minutes, how much of it is truth and how much of it is hype? First, the basics. June 2004. The media called to the outskirts of Ahmedabad to find police standing over four people shot dead. Ishrat Jahan, a 19-year-old girl from Mumbra in Mumbai. Javed Sheikh from Pune, who was travelling with Ishrat. And the others, Zishan Johar and Amjad Ali, said to be from Pakistan. The Gujarat police FIR saying that they were a LET group on their way to kill the Gujarat Chief Minister Narendra Modi and top BJP leaders. The two sides exchanged fire, the FIR says, and the four were shot dead. But the CBI, nine years later, finds that it was a fake encounter. All four killed were already in Gujarat police custody and it charged a number of Gujarat police officials with murder. The CBI said that prima facie, the three men appeared to have terrorist links, but there is no evidence to suggest Ishrat was a terrorist. Seven months later, in another charge sheet, the CBI names officers of the Intelligence Bureau for their role in the conspiracy. Let's now look at the specific questions being raised about all of this, most notably by the former Home Secretary G.K. Pillai, who's gone on record to say that it was a successful operation by the IB, what he called a controlled operation, that Ishrat may well have terror links, and that political motivations led the Congress to cover up this fact. The former NSA M.K. Narayanan has also echoed similar sentiment, as have a host of officials. Let's look at each of those statements individually, first to understand it and then see if it adds up, starting with this business of a controlled operation. Praveen Swami, firstly, what is a controlled operation? Uh, what we do know from the CBI's investigation and from earlier media investigation is that in this case, uh, based on information acquired from a terrorist cell in Jammu and Kashmir, the Intelligence Bureau had uh, located two uh, Lashkar-e-Taiba sympathizers in Ahmedabad, uh, who in the CBI's records are identified by the code names C1 and C2, and then used those, uh, 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 those uh, Lashkar-e-Taiba sympathizers to lure Fidayin to Jammu and Kashmir, uh, basically, the Fidayin uh, were given the impression that they would be coming to uh, execute a plot against Narendra Modi. Uh, but of course, uh, there, there was no plot. Uh, the, the whole thing was, if you like, a setup. Uh, uh, and, and this is what uh, Mr. Pillay meant by a controlled operation. The charge sheet details evidence of how they were kept in safe houses in Ahmedabad, some of them for weeks at a time. And questioned. So once they'd picked them up, what ideally should have been done? Uh, well, there isn't an SOP in these things, but uh, I mean, the law is very, very clear. They, the, the terrorists uh, ought to have been arrested and tried. Uh, you, you cannot go around murdering people. And these two questions uh, ought not be confused with each other. One doesn't have a bearing on the other. We're joined by one of the lead investigators in the Ishrat case, Satish Varma. G.K. Pillai suggests that this may not have been a fake encounter. He says this was a brilliant IB operation. What would you say to that? Okay. Now, you have to really distinguish between a genuine and a brilliant IB operation and, and a real encounter. Now, the point is, if you are monitoring people, and you know how monitoring happens. Monitoring happens by surveillance, including electronic surveillance. You can almost see those people walk. So if this is true, which is true, I will say, because the CBI charge sheet exactly says the same thing, that this was a controlled operation of the IB, where some people came here, they were caught, they were clubbed with Javed and Ishrat and killed in cold blood. Ironically, by admitting that it is a controlled operation, has G.K. Pillai validated the prosecution's case? So actually, G.K. Pillai corroborates what the CBI investigation is. And therefore, I'm saying that if this is information that G.K. Pillai has, 
and had as Home Secretary, then G.K. Pillai should actually be cited as a prosecution witness because he's corroborating and confirming the investigation of the CBI. So the controlled operation theory legally doesn't change the CBI's conclusion. Where the BJP does have a stronger case is Pillai's claim that the UPA tried to cover up Ishrat's LET links. Now legally, the antecedents of Ishrat shouldn't matter. A fake encounter is a fake encounter whether the person is a terrorist or not. But this question has unfortunately become central because of politics. For the Congress and a section of liberal opinion, it became imperative to show that she was a wide-eyed innocent. That would make the crime of the Gujarat government all the more abhorrent. Equally for the BJP and those accused in the encounter, if it could be established that she was a terrorist, then at least in the eyes of a section of opinion, it legitimizes the staged killing. Which has meant that both sides have chosen to filter the information in their own way, overlooking the ambiguities in the Ishrat narrative. It is in this context that one needs to understand Mr. Pillai's allegation that his boss, P. Chidambaram, doctored a Home Ministry affidavit in 2009. The first affidavit, 14 pages, was the centre's response to a Supreme Court petition by Ishrat's mother asking for a CBI inquiry. The affidavit countered each of these arguments made by Shamima and cited intelligence inputs mentioning Ishrat as a terrorist as reasons why no CBI probe was needed. Change the BJP immediately used this to claim a political win. So are we made to understand that the government earlier had filed a false affidavit? Can the government or the union government change their sworn affidavits? What is the correct position? Seven weeks later, a panicked Congress submitted a second one, which said that the intelligence inputs cannot be taken at face value and that there is scope for a CBI inquiry. Therefore, what they are saying is absolutely incorrect. They are only trying to build up and manufacture a defence, which is absolutely not correct. Hmm. And the way then Gujarat Chief Minister, uh, Mr. Narendra Modi ji and uh, Mr. Amit Shah ji, who was the then Home Minister, were yes. accounted for this was extremely painful. Mr. Chidambaram has by now gone on record and accepted that he Absolutely did change the affidavit. And if this was done under instructions from the Congress High Command, as the BJP has alleged, that is deeply cynical politics. Randeep Surjewala, it seems shocking that a Home Minister would bypass procedures to make changes to an affidavit just to implicate a political rival. Possibly cannot be, unless and until we say that the division bench of the High Court and the district judge both who are co-conspirators of the Congress party to fix Mr. Narendra Modi, which even Mr. Modi is also not saying, it would be a futile uh, question to raise an answer. The simple question is that in accordance with orders of the High Court, now there is an ongoing trial. Why is Modi government trying to derail that trial? But what exactly was the evidence that was being sought to be covered up? The original MHA affidavit raises questions about the defence advanced by Ishrat's mother, that she was busy with tuition work, attending college and charity work, and that of late she had started working with a neighbour and acquaintance Javed Sheikh in his perfume business. The affidavit, however, questions the absence of any explanation by the family on the specifics of her work, where was the shop she went to, what products she sold and so on. And as we reported in 2013, those gaps in the narrative do exist, despite claims by the family to the contrary. An explanation that does not address their extensive travels to Lucknow, Ahmedabad and Surat chronicled through hotel records where they would often sign in with an alias. The SIT and the CBI acknowledge this saying that Ishrat may have understood that Javed was engaged in illegal activities involving smuggling and counterfeit currency.